Okay, we are uh, continuing our study this morning about uh, the great I Am, and uh, this is, I think, our third study in talking about the holiness of God and trying to come to a, uh, a better grasp uh, of what that means and especially what that means to us and how we can uh, be, better, be better servants of the Lord based upon a, a better understanding of His holiness. Uh, just in, in brief way of review, in case you have not been here, uh, here's what we have talked about in just introduction and uh, the first few points that we've made in this study. First of all, there may, no, there may be no greater quality about God that we need to understand and grasp than His holiness. Uh, there, are, uh, there are so many passages that talk about uh, the holy God. And obviously those passages in the book of Isaiah and the book of Revelation where, uh, those, uh, where those heavenly creatures are surrounding the throne of God saying, Holy, holy, holy. This is something we need to understand uh, and something that uh, we need to have a, a greater appreciation for. When we talk about the holiness of God, we see that um, partly His holiness means that He transcends everything. He transcends all. Uh, he is above all. He's above all the earth, above the heavens. And this is not just talking about physical distance. That's not what it's talking about at all. It's just talking about His prominence uh, and the preeminence that He is to have because He is the only God. Uh, there is no other God. There is one God, and as we looked at a few weeks ago, uh, there is no other God. Not even is there no other God. There's no God like Him. There's nothing like Him. Uh, there, there is nothing that we can that we can create or that we can imagine that compares to our God. And so we started a couple weeks ago saying, here's three, three aspects of the holiness of God that we need to grasp. And if we can grasp these, then in a practical sense, we will have a better understanding of what it means to say that God is holy. The first thing we looked at is that the holy God cannot be associated with evil and sin. It is just contrary to His very nature. Uh, it's, it's, not necessar it's not necessarily a choice that He has made or a choice that He makes uh, on, on a daily or perpetual basis. It is, a, it is a violation of His very nature, and therefore He cannot be associated with sin or evil of any kind. Now, the flip side of that, the other side of that, in, in like manner, is uh, where we ended up the last time we were together, and that is looking at the fact that the Holy God, while He cannot be associated with evil, He is set apart unto righteousness and justice. His nature, his very, the very foundation of His throne, is one of righteousness and justice. That's what permeates His throne, that's what permeates His very being, uh, and that is that there is no evil, there is no sin that can invade the presence of God. Now, we've had some interesting discussions about what all that means. Uh, we've talked about the fact that if God cannot be associated with evil, if He cannot be associated with sin, then what about us? Are we sinful creatures? Um, if God by His nature, Habakkuk 1 and verse 13 says His eyes are too pure to behold evil. You know Isaiah 59 says that your iniquities have separated you from God. If all of us commit sin, if all of us commit iniquity, then how can we possibly dwell in the presence of God? How can we possibly have the acceptance, the approval, and the love of God if we sin and His very nature will not allow us to appear before Him in a sinful condition? How do we figure that out? What do we do with that? Well, we look at His nature being one of righteousness. And then we look at this third point, which is maybe 
what will help us today to understand this a little better. And that is that not only is God's nature, uh, not only does, does his, uh, not only can he not be associated with evil and sin, not only is he uh, set apart under righteousness, but it is God who decides what is holy. It is God who sets apart those things that are common and sets them apart for his purposes, and God alone determines what is holy. Think about, think about these, these points. Without some connection or designation with, by God, nothing can be considered as holy. When you go back to the Old Testament, and obviously there's several examples on the screen. When you go back to the Old Testament, where do you think is the first time that the word holy is found in the Bible, but obviously in the Old Testament? Where do you think the first time the word holy is found? Boy, we're just talkative this morning, aren't we? When Moses saw the bush that was burning, but was not consumed, walked over to that bush, and a voice spoke to him from that bush. What did that voice say? Take off your sandals, your shoes. Why? Because the ground where you are standing is holy ground. What? Holy ground? Have you ever seen holy ground? You know, where, where, where was Moses when he saw this burning bush? What, what land was he in? Land of Midian. He was near Mount Sinai, which is where he would end up a few years later. How long had Moses been in that land? You remember, you remember when Moses was 40 years old and he was in Egypt? Uh, what did he witness happening in Egypt? A murder. A murder of who? By who? Okay. So he witnesses a murder, and then does he stay in town or does he leave town? Why does he flee? Why does he flee from Egypt? Okay. Okay. Started fearing for his own life. Uh, he was concerned about uh, the, uh, the reputation that appeared to be being built based upon what he saw and, and his evaluation of it. So Moses flees to Midian when he's 40 years old. He stays in the land of Midian for 40 years. When Moses saw that burning bush and he walked over to it, the Bible does not indicate to us that Moses saw anything out of the ordinary except for the bush. The Bible does not indicate that he saw anything out of the ordinary about the ground. Do you, do you, think, the gra do you think the grass was a lot greener on the holy side than it was on the unholy side? Maybe the dirt wasn't quite as dirty on the holy side as it was on the unholy side. Do you think that Moses stepped from the dirty dirt into the clean dirt, and he said, wow, this dirt is so much cleaner. It feels so much better. Was there anything in your mind, was there anything perce perceptible to the eyes of Moses to say this was holy ground and this was not holy ground? Nothing he could visibly see. Then why did God say, this is holy ground? Because God was present. And His very presence made that which surrounded Him to be holy. What does it mean to be holy? To be set apart. To be set apart for His purposes. And so God had set apart this ground. For what purpose? For Him to dwell there. When, when, uh, when, when God gave Moses the... Uh, the blueprints, the instructions for building the tabernacle. The tabernacle was divided into two compartments, into two rooms. Sometimes the entire tabernacle was called 
the holy tabernacle or the holy house of God or even the holy temple uh, in the days later. But that, that tabernacle was divided into two compartments. You remember what they were called? The first compartment, the first room they came into was called what? The holy place. God said to call it the holy place. And in this room, um, I don't even know if we have a classroom this small. Well, maybe about the size of one of our classrooms uh, down this hallway, take off a couple feet. In this room, what was in that first, that first room of the tabernacle? Y'all got to speak up or something, enunciate. The, the table of showbread? Not yet. The, 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 the candelabras? The, the, uh, the candlestick? Candlestick, table of showbread. What else is in there? First room. The basin. Now, you're jumping ahead there, Chuck. You're, you're one of our advanced students, and you always, you always foresee where we're going. No, see, when you get to the second room, the first room is the holy place that's been set apart. The second room is the what? The most holy place, or the holy of holies. Why is that room more holy? Because in that room is what? The Ark of the Covenant. What's in the Ark of the Covenant, Chuck? Ten Commandments. Aaron's rod that had budded. Pot of manna. What was on top of the Ark of the Covenant? The mercy seat. What was so special about the mercy seat? That is where the presence of God dwelt in the midst of the people. When they went, when, when, well not they, when he, the high priest, once a year, went into the most holy place, the holy of holies, there he was in the presence of God. God had set apart that room for only one man to enter one time a year because that was something that he had designated as holy. Were there certain rules, certain stipulations for entering that room? Were there certain rules, certain stipulations for the tabernacle as a whole? When you go back and you read uh, Exodus, what is it, Exodus 25, 26, 27, where he's first given the instructions, and then you read the last five chapters of the book of Exodus, where Moses takes the instructions, follows the instructions, and builds the tabernacle, were they specific instructions? The color of the cloth, the length of the cloth, the number of boards, the length of the boards, the number of rings. That Was God specific in how He wanted that tabernacle to be designed and to be built? Yes. Why? Because it was holy to the Lord. What was so special about the wood? It's just acacia wood. What's so special about? It's special because it belongs to God. Because God had set it apart. When, when Aaron and the high priests chose, made the garments that they would wear, God called them holy garments. What's the big deal? It's just cloth. These are garments that God had set apart for His purposes. And there are several examples, obviously, here that the holy ground, the holy tabernacle, the feast days were holy. The Sabbath, the temple became holy, the garments, the, the showbread, the holy bread, um, the vessels and the oil. So many things that we could talk about from the Old Testament that were common, ordinary things. Could, uh, could uh, let's, let's pick somebody. Could Joshua have come along after Moses and uh, could Joshua have decided, you know what, I want my own tabernacle. You know, I, I, there's Moses' tabernacle. That's for everybody else to worship. I want my own. Could he have followed the same blueprint, same boards, same length, same cloth, same everything? Could he have made one and built it to look exactly like Moses' tabernacle? Sure, why not? What would have been the difference between Moses' tabernacle and Joshua's tabernacle? 
God is the difference. One was commanded by, approved by, detailed by, and dwelt in by God. The other one, plain old ordinary tabernacle. They looked the same, but they were not the same. Now, God takes that which is common, sets it apart, and calls it to be holy. Look in Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7. And then we're going to look in 1 Peter chapter 2. So if you're one of our advanced students, like Chuck is, and uh, if you want to get Deuteronomy 7, if, if your fingers want to do some walking, then you can get over to 1 Peter 2, and we'll be over there too. Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 6. God says to the Jews, to the Israelites, this is Moses preaching to them before he dies, right before they enter the promised land, Deuteronomy 7 and verse 6, God says, for you are a what? You are a holy people to the Lord your God. Well, wait a minute. They're just people, aren't they? Do they look different? I mean, it, it, does, does their hair have a certain glow to it that nobody else did? They're just people, aren't they? They're just people. But because they are God's people, because they dwell in the presence of God and God dwells in them, God has set them apart and made them holy, for you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for who? For Himself. You belong to God. These are not ordinary people. God, God chose that ground. Why? He chose the ground to be used for Him, for His purposes and His presence. Here are people. God chooses people. He chose these people to be His, to dwell in His presence, to be His people, a special treasure above all the peoples in the face of the earth. You got 1 Peter chapter 2? Similar words over in 1 Peter chapter 2, but this time it's not being addressed to Jews, to Israelites. 1 Peter chapter 2 is being addressed to Christians. New Testament Christians. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. But you are a chosen generation. Deuteronomy 7 verse 6, God says to the Jews, God has chosen you to be a people for Himself. That's what 1 Peter 2 and verse 9 is saying about Christians. God has chosen you. You are a chosen generation, group of people. You are a royal priesthood. There is royalty about being a Christian. There is royalty because we are a priesthood. Go back up to verse 5. Is it verse 5 in 1 Peter chapter 2 where the word royal is not before the word priesthood, but what word is before the word priesthood up in verse 5? Holy priesthood, a holy priesthood, a royal priesthood who has direct access to God. The priest in the Old Testament had direct access to God. But was everybody a priest in the Old Testament? What tribe did you have to be from to be a priest in the Old Testament? The tribe of Levi. So if you were from Reuben or from Simeon, or from Gad, or from Asher, did you have direct access to God? Well, through a priest, but mm, you weren't from the tribe of Levi. God says to Christians, what tribe are Christians from? What tribe are Christians from? Go over to the book of Revelation. Y'all don't know what tribe you're from? That's kind of that's disappointing. Just kidding. Revelation chapter 5. We're coming back to 1 Peter chapter 2. We're just taking a little detour here. This is found uh, more than once in the book of Revelation, but we're just going to look at it in this one verse. Revelation chapter 5 and uh, verse number 9. Well, back up to verse number 8. When they had taken the scroll, when he had taken the scroll, Christ had, the Lamb of God. Four living creatures, twenty-four elders, fell down before the Lamb, before Christ, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And what are they singing to the Lamb? Chapter 5 and verse 9. They sang a new song and said, You are worthy 
to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and have redeemed to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. What tribe are you from? You're from every tribe. Does it matter, does it matter where you were born? Does it matter who your parents were? Does it matter if you had money or didn't have money? Does it matter if, uh, if you can trace your lineage back to Abraham or if you can trace your lineage back to Hitler? Christ bought by His blood who? Everybody. By His blood He bought people out of every tribe. Uh, it didn't matter what tribe. Or that was just a little detour. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Royal priesthood called a holy priesthood in verse 5. Verse 9 says, this is not only a holy and royal priesthood, but you are a holy nation. You are God's own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of Him who did what? He called you out of darkness and brought you into His marvelous light. You once were not a people, verse 10. You once were nothing. But now you are the people of God. You once had not, you didn't have mercy before. You hadn't obtained mercy, but now you have obtained the mercy of God. What is it about Christians? What is it that makes Christians holy? What do you think? What is it that makes Christians holy? The blood of Jesus. Say again. They are in Christ. Somebody said something over here. God's forgiveness. Willie, did you say something? Obedience. What made the Israelites, the Jews, holy? When God said, you are a, you are a holy people to me. What made them holy? their relationship with God. It was God who had made them holy. New Testament Christians, what is it that makes them holy? Well, the, the simple answer is it's God who makes us holy. Is it possible for us to be holy apart from God? I think it was on the first slide in our introduction of this, of this a few weeks ago. Does holiness have any meaning at all without God? It is shameful. Uh, it is uh, sickening to hear people take today the word holy. What, what definition, what meaning does the word holy have without God? I mean, in, 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 a, in a secular sense, in, in, in just a, an, an everyday sense, what does is, what is it mean to be holy without an attachment to God? There is no meaning to it. And yet people will take that word. You know that the Bible says that holy and reverend is His name? That's God. Holy and reverend, not any man. No man is, is that holy and reverend is the name of God. And yet they take that name of God. They take holy, 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 and they'll say, holy, holy cow. Holy moly. All right, let's stop there because you know there's some other ones that aren't, so, that aren't going to be mentioned in a class like this, right? They take that word and then attach something else to it. What meaning does that word have apart from God? No meaning at all. But God has taken us as Christians, and He has set us apart. That's what holy means. He has set us apart from all other people. Do we look like other people? Come back to this understanding of the ground, the, the garments, the everything else. Did it look different? Do we look different than other people? If you were to throw us into a, uh, if you were to throw us in, into a crowd at a football stadium, 
and, uh, and there's, uh, you go to Michigan State, how many can you get into Michigan, is it 100 and something, is 80, what is that number, I can't, now I've said Michigan, I can't think of it, 80 something thousand, I think they can get over 100,000 at Michigan, can't they, what's the number, I, I've lost the number, put us in a crowd of 80,000 people, can somebody say, oh, there's a Christian, yep, there's a Christian over there, and get their binoculars and look across the Look across the field. Yep, there's a Christian sitting in that seat up there. Do we look different? I mean, is there a certain glow about our hair? You know, do our eyes have a certain gleam or sparkle or... Do we look different? On the outside, we don't look different. Okay. So what's so special about being holy? When the Lord God looks down from heaven... Can God tell a difference? Does God see those who are holy? Yes. yes. Why? Because in God's eyes, He has taken those who are holy and He has set them apart. He sees them differently. When God looks at you and me as His children, He sees us differently. He sees us as being holy. So what do I need to do? I, I, I want to finish this holiness today if we can. What do we need to do? Here's four things. Here's four things that you and I can do to honor the holiness of God and to, and to secure our place in the presence of God. And, and some of these are going to be obvious because we've already talked about them, but it's coming and making them practical to us. First of all, the Christian needs to make a distinction. Christian needs to draw a line in the separation between that which is holy and that which is not holy. Um, Mike Barnes here. I thought I saw Mike earlier. A couple Sundays ago, after we had talked about holiness, when Mike presided at the Lord's table, he read from Leviticus chapter 10. What was happening in Leviticus chapter 10? Who do we read about in Leviticus 10? Nadab and Abihu. Nadab and Abihu, in the first two verses, they came to bring a sacrifice unto the Lord, but the Bible says that they brought strange or unauthorized fire before God. What was the result? Death. When God, when God responded, besides having them put to death, when God responded, notice what God says, By those who come near to me, I must, it's not optional, it's not just a good idea, I must be regarded as holy. When we come before God, whether that be in worship or whether that be in serving Him on a daily basis, the Bible says that we must regard God and everything about God to be holy. Do you suppose that, uh, and, and we don't know, so we have to suppose, do you suppose that, that Nadab and Abihu looked at fire and said, yeah, fire's fire, isn't it? I mean, to you and me, isn't fire fire? I mean, do you like to play with some fire, but you won't play with other fire? You know, is, is some fire safe, but some fire's not so safe? To Nadab and Abihu, fire's fire, it all burns. It looks the same. But had God given them specified commandments in this regard? As Christians, when we approach God and serving God, we have got to understand that when God makes something holy, when God separates something out as holy, we must not therefore turn around and make it something common, something ordinary. Look in, look in Ezekiel chapter 22. Here's a passage that uh, I think most have heard before. Nadab and Abihu, what tribe were they born into? The tribe of Levi. Uh, who was their father? Aaron. Aaron the high priest was their father. So here are two priests in Nadab and Abihu. 
Um, in Nadab and Abihu, two priests, you would think they are righteous, godly men who would be concerned about following the commands of God. Ezekiel chapter 22 is where we're going. But there were some problems with those two priests named Nadab and Abihu. Those were not the only two priests that had a problem in serving God. We don't have time to look at this whole passage, but look in Ezekiel 22 and verse 26. Her priests, Israel's priests, they're, they're godly people, the people you have to go to to reproach God. I mean, they, these should have been the premier citizens of the nation. Her priests have violated my law and have profaned my holy things. They have not distinguished between the holy and the unholy, nor have they made known the difference between the unclean and the clean. They have hidden their eyes from my Sabbaths so that I am profane among them. If I do not distinguish between that which is holy and that which is unholy, what have I done? What's, what's a word used at least twice in this passage? What's a word used here that I have done? I have profaned the things of God. What, what, what is our evaluation of profanity? Good thing? Upright thing? Um, I'm not talking about our society's evaluation of profanity. I'm talking about ours. Um, was profanity allowed in your house growing up? Um, what would have happened, suppose, if, uh, if your mother or your father had heard you using profanity? What would you say, Norm? Uh, would there have been consequences? Makes me sick to hear these little kids sitting in the grocery cart. That's how little they are. They're still sitting in the grocery cart at the store, and they'll say a profane word, and their parents think it's so cute. <laughs> say that again. That was funny. That's sick. That's what that is. Norm? Yes, that's right. If we are Christians, then the Lord walks with us daily. What do we need to be doing? Separating, distinguishing between what God has made holy and what's not holy. What does that mean? In a practical sense, what does that mean? Are there words that are holy that should never be used in a profane way? Should the name of God ever be used, the holy name of God ever be used in a profane way? God forbid that that should ever happen. There are not only words that are holy, are there actions that are holy that should never be treated as common or ordinary? And, and that's, that's the opposite of holy. You know, we, we think here's holy, here's unholy, here's holy, here's profane. The reality is here's holy, here's common. I, I don't treat the name of God like it's a common, ordinary thing. It's not. Are there actions, are there behaviors as a Christian that are holy that I should never treat as common and ordinary and big deal if that happens or not? One of the points that we're going to make uh, as we look at this, and, and we can go ahead and make it now because uh, we're not going to finish this. We'll have to finish it next time. Is, is the worship of God holy? I don't see how anybody could say no to that question. Is the worship of God holy? Is God holy? Yes. Should He be approached in a holy way? Meaning in a way that He has set apart. How, how, would, you like to, how would you like to make up a way to approach God? Well, there's a holy God, and, and, and He's a God who has, uh, has certain expectations. And, and he has made commandments. But, you know, I think I'll come over here like the illustration we made earlier of Joshua making his own tabernacle. I think I'll just come over here and, and I'll kind of manufacture my way to approach God because this is what's meaningful to me. What have we forgotten? 
that God is holy. And it is God alone who makes things holy. And so when we approach God in worship to Him, is it a good idea to make it up as I go? Is it a good idea to say, well, this is what is meaningful and helpful to me? All of a sudden, when we take that mindset, we have deviated, detoured the purpose and the direction of worship, and we pointed it squarely upon ourselves. Here's what's meaningful to me. Here's what would help me in worship. And all of a sudden, I become the focus and the direction of worship instead of the Holy God. And what have I just done with worship of God? I've made it profane. If I approach God, think about the words of Jesus. and Well, Jesus quotes from Isaiah, but think about when He quotes from Isaiah in Matthew chapter 15, verses 8 and 9, when Jesus says, They draw near to me with what? Hear their lips. They draw near to me with their lips, with their mouth. They honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Well, wait a minute. Can you approach God? Can you honor God with your lips and with your mouth, but your heart not be in it? Is that holy? <coughs> Approaching God is holy. But if my heart is not in it, I have taken something that is holy and I have dumbed it down. I have brought it into a realm of common and profane. And if I sing, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, but that's not coming from my heart. That's coming from my lips and my mouth. And boy, I'll belt it out when there's 400 of us here and we'll sound really good. But if it's not generated from a heart that is full of love, and instead if my heart is centered more upon other things of this world, concerned about things at the house, concerned about the fight I had with my family on the way here, or whatever, my lips might be saying it, but my heart isn't. What would be better, to do that or just to use profanity in the face of God? What's the difference? If I'm taking something that should be holy and bringing it down and not focusing on it. I'm saying, what's the big deal? It's just like any other worship. We've sang this song 400 times, you know, since we moved in this building. It, you know, we've sung it all these times. You know, it doesn't have any meaning. It's just like any other song. What do you all think about that? I know that's kind of hard. God has taken that which is holy. And He's taken us. And He's made us holy. Do you have to be perfect to be holy? Do you have to be sinless to be holy? Isn't that what we think? I mean, it... If, if you're holy, that must, be, that must mean you've never sinned. Had Israel ever sinned? Look at these rebellious people who continually turned against God, and God turns to them and says, you're a holy people to me. What? Are you serious? Those, those people are a bunch of rebels. No, they're my people. Yeah, that's true. God takes His people. Sets us apart. What is it that makes us holy? We'll finish with this. That verse in Re that we looked at in our detour to Revelation 5 and verse 9. What is it that makes us holy? It's the blood of Christ taking away our sins, setting us apart to be holy in the eyes of God. And as we remain faithful unto the Lord, not perfect, but faithful, what does the blood of Christ keep on doing? Keeps on cleansing us, so I keep on being holy in the eyes of God. All right, we got another lesson on holiness. Next week, we might finish this one and, uh, and get into our next study. Thank you for your good participation this morning.